the historical roots of the rapidly expanding cult of Mary with the worship of ancient goddesses and other pagan practices have been examined in an earlier chapter. Such links now seem to strengthen what we assumed before, or even proved before. The New Age movement is undoubtedly advancing on many fronts, not least in the Church, which will not endure sound doctrine, having itching ears. Many Christians have drunk deep drafts of New Age potions. For example, holistic health, hypnosis, yoga, inner healing, meditation, psychical research and awareness training, and many have imbibed new doctrines and heresies based on the humanistic and positive thinking of Taylor de Chardin, Norman Vincent Peale and others which provide the church with its emphasis on an earthly kingdom now, the social gospel and society reconstructed for Christianized with kingdom principles for the Lord's return. Restorationist leader Bryn Jones, writing in the beginning of 1991, promised his followers that, quote, by the power of his spirit, we will bring all that is against God and man beneath Christ's authority. God's church will be the most influential body of people on earth in the final period of this age. Unquote. This is indeed a prophetic word, but it is fulfilled in scripture only by the apostate church of the book of Revelation. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jogler 66, Hour of the Truth. This one's called Protestantism Under Siege, deals with chapter 9 of the book All Roads Lead to Rome from Michael de Semlian. Almost half the book has been read this far, thus far. <laughs> um, 21 chapters <coughs> and we're in chapter 9 right now. And I'm going to add a little bit extra to this English version than I do to the German version. But you will hear that later on when I'm reading. Protestantism under siege. Well, the whole ecumenical movement, starting really with Vatican II, the Second Vatican Council, between 1963 and 1965, is actually putting Protestantism under siege. It is a war that is waged against Protestants. It is a war that is waged against true Bible-believing Christians. From that time on? No. From the Council of Trent on? No. From the time of Constantine on? No. Even from before. True Bible-believing Christians have always been persecuted, even to the times of the Roman Caesars, right after Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross. The persecution of true Christians started then and it always maybe took another form as time changed but Rome never changes. It didn't change in the past, it doesn't change now. But since the ecumenical movement is working so well because the people love just to be betrayed, Protestantism now is really under siege. But okay, let's continue on page 102 of the book All Roads Lead to Rome from Michael de Semlian. As a member of the London-based United Protestant Council put it, quote, as it is Protestantism which stands in the way of a united papal Ireland, so it is Protestantism its resistance to decreasing decreasing rapidly, but still exercising the power of prayer, which prevents the domination of the Roman system everywhere else." Unquote. Yeah, prayer prevents the domination of the Roman system. The prayer to our Lord and King Jesus Christ, who is the only one who protects us here on this earth from the beast system. 
The author of this book recognizes that the term Protestant is problematic for many because of its associations with excess and extremes of behavior that were reported in the press relating to Northern Ireland. Although there are probably more Bible-believing Christians there in proportion to population than perhaps anywhere else, anyone can adopt any label to gain respectability. As in the Lebanon, the term Christian is widely used by political parties and factions as well as military groups. The revenge-seeking terrorists totally discredit the term Protestant and are in no wise submitted to Christ and His word. The term evangelical no longer carries the meaning that it once did either, referring now to all those who take on board as much sound doctrine only as squares with their own particular world view. Another word for this long and extensive sentence is compromise. Protestants, true Bible-believing Christians, compromise their beliefs to get along with the powers that be. That's it. No more and no less. And it should not be this way. And the name Protestants, the author says here, is used by terrorists. Well, that's the same with the word Christians. You always read about Christians persecuted here and there. And when you take a better look at it in the media, you will see that it is actually not Christians, it's most of the times Catholics, or even Orthodox. People from the Orthodox Church hold the same belief as Roman Catholics. The only difference is they do not, they do not acknowledge the superior power of the Roman Pontiff. That's all. But the, for the rest, <coughs> is their belief system and their idolatry exactly the same as in Roman Catholicism. Now we come to another interesting part here that is called managing the media. And when we are going into this, I can tell you right now, first and for all, the author made a footnote in this little part of the book that he didn't make in the German edition. So I will read to you, of course, the footnote that is included here. But second of all, managing the media, I have expounded on that on previous broadcasts, not in this book reading, but on other broadcasts, on Hour of the Truth and anywhere else in other book readings. Managing the media, you can look that up when you go to the book Rulers of Evil, or you can go to the internet and search it for yourself. Just go and Google um, Miranda Prorsos and Inter Mirifica, two encyclicals, the first one written by uh, Pope Pius XII in 1957, and the other one, uh, Inter Mirifica, was published in the beginning of Vatican Council II by Pope uh, uh, John, uh, John VI in 1963, Inter Mirifica, where the Roman Catholic Church states that it is the inherent right of the Roman Catholic Church to use and to own all media, the press, the radio, the television, the movie industry, and everything that since 1963 has been added to the media, like social media, like the internet that was not there at that time. The Roman Catholic Church calls it her inherent right to possess and use all these media. So when there's anybody out there who says, oh, it's the Jews that run the media, yes, maybe a few frontmen, but behind them you will always find the Gentile papal orders, like the Knights of Malta, the Knights of the Holy Cross, the Knights of Columbus, and things like that. Look it up for yourself. It is that way. We are, according to Luke, living in the times of the Gentiles and not in the time of the Jews. The media is run by Roman Catholics. And if you want to get a deeper look into that, <coughs> I can advise you to go to my reading, on, or my reading, my show on Hour of the Truth. It is simply amazing, where I read and explain to you a newsletter from Daryl Eberhardt from many years ago, where he puts out many, many points that prove 
that everything is run, that proves that everything is run by the Roman Catholic Church. But going into this managing the media, as the Roman SUN sun has risen, so the Protestant light has dimmed. Somehow, imperceptibly and subtly, the Protestant character of the Anglican and nonconformist faith has been undermined in the public perception. Protestantism has become a term of abuse to many, tainted as it is by the violence and rhetoric of Northern Ireland politics, but the skill with which the Roman Catholic institution, with its long practice and admired mastery over both information and disinformation, manages the media, is unique in the field of public relations, which is just a new word for propaganda. As the Apostle John expressed in Revelation 6, 17, verse 6, quote, And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration, unquote. So very often the religious hero of stage, films, television and radio is the Roman Catholic priest or nun. Not all that long ago it was almost an event to see a nun in public. By definition, they were usually hidden from view. Now we see them prominently and frequently in the media, playing snooker, employing entrepreneurial skills, standing their ground and defending their rights and what is quote-unquote right. Likewise, media coverage of important events and national tragedies increasingly seem to give prominence to the Roman Catholic faith. Feature articles in the influential press, Sunday services on television, Religious programs and plays on BBC Radio all seem to be heading in the same ecumenical direction. We may expect this trend to continue and gather pace following the recent appointment of Jesuit educated Stephen Whittle to the post of Head of Religious Programs on BBC Television. In an interview with the Roman Catholic newspaper The Universe, he spoke enthusiastically of the enormous impact of the Catholic Church, of the terrific songs of praise which came from Westminster Cathedral with Cardinal Hume on Easter Day. He also spoke of, quote, the programs on prayer which are being repeated done, uh, repeated, done by Father Gary Hughes, a Jesuit, by the way, and of how, quote, for him and the Eucharist is the heart of Christianity, unquote, as you can read in the universe from 23rd of April 1989. So, according to F Jesuit Father Gary Hughes, for him the Eucharist is the heart of Christianity. Is that biblical doctrine or is that Roman Catholic tradition? Anyway, here comes the little footnote the author adds to the article. Jesuit Father Gary Hughes made ecumenical history at the annual Baptist Assembly in April 1991, when he became the first Catholic priest to address a major session on, of the Assembly. Father Hughes, S.J., received an enthusiastic reception from more than 1,000 Baptists meeting at the Bournemouth International Center, with his address on the spirituality of freedom, unquote, that we can read in The Universe, the 5th of May, 1991. Catholic charismatics like Charles Whitehead, Jesuit educated international coordinator for charismatic renewal for England and Wales, are beginning to feature on television and the other media as the charismatic movement becomes established. An article in the Sunday Telegraph in March 1991 argued that with George Carey as Archbishop of Canterbury, the charismatic renewal already well on the way is likely before long to become the establishment within the established Church of England. We can thus expect religious programming on television and radio to increasingly feature ecumenical leaders like Charles Whitebread and David Elton. 
yeah, we can expect religious programming. And surely, when you look behind the scenes, when you look at movies and television series where they always plant Catholic symbols and idols everywhere for you to see, and this subconsciously actu uh, actually makes a lot of people accept him, the holy... <laughs> No, there's nothing holy about it. The Roman Catholic faith. yeah, Because you are bombarded with signals and signs everywhere and you don't even recognize them anymore. Christmas 1990 demonstrated the trend towards Roman Catholic Church services on television. Four out of seven programs relating to Christianity from the 24th to 26th of December were filmed in Roman Catholic churches or dealt with the lives of Roman Catholic churchmen. The Christmas edition of the Sunday Times magazine of 24th of December 1988 majored on the theme, quote, Who was Jesus? Unquote. The front cover featured the Virgin Mary enthroned as Queen of Heaven, wearing a tiara, glittering with jewelry and holding a baby Jesus with flaxen hair. Inside, under the heading, What Happened to Christianity, much acclaimed novelist and Catholic Anthony Burgess, author of A Clockwork Orange, wrote as if Roman Catholicism were the majority and not a minority faith in this country. England, the author, is speaking of, and actually also used to be a minority in the United States of America. Other Roman Catholics, celebrities whose f claim to fame on the face of it would not seem to have a ready connection with their religious faith, feature prominently in articles about the Roman Catholic faith in the media. An example of this was the exposure given to the face of the novelist and lapsed Catholic Graham Greene in several newspapers after his 85th birthday in 1989. The extraordinary aspect of this reporting was the evident conclusion <coughs> that Mr. Green, who styled himself a, quote, Catholic agnostic, unquote, had very little faith, if any. Some of his novels deal with the themes of faith and guilt, reflecting the author's experiences with Catholicism, which he thought, quote, nearer the truth than any other religion of the world, unquote, rather than his devotion to it. The Observer article quoted another national newspaper, quote, billing him as possibly the world's most famous Catholic layman, unquote, and comes to the conclusion at the end of the piece that, quote, serious is the one thing Mr. Green's Christianity is not, unquote. Serious is the one thing Mr. Green's Christianity is not. Christianity or Catholicism. Hey? Yet, when Mr. Green died in 1991, prominent in the news bulletins were descriptions of him as, quote, a convert to Catholicism. Just as the World Wide Fund for Nature, WWF, choose Franciscans to represent Christianity for their interfaith initiative, as we read in the chapter before, so also did the television company select a Roman Catholic as spokesman for Christianity during the Gulf War at the end of 1990. Their choice was a devout Catholic, Brigadier Hammerback. But according to a report in the Daily Telegraph, quote, in his final message to the troops, the Brigadier decided to quote from the Gospel according to Star Wars rather than the Bible. Quote, the Force is with us, unquote he told the headquarters troops of the Royal Scots, quote, God bless you all, we are going to do the business, unquote. You can read that in the Daily Telegraph, 4th of February, 1991. The force is with us. Only with brainwashed soldiers you can use terms like these and then make it even sound at its as if it were coming from the Bible. Poet Gerald Manley Hopkins has been featured in the media on a number of occasions where emphasis has been placed more on his contribution to the Jesuit order than his contribution to English verse. 
the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola deploy alien to Bible believing Christians, deeply, sorry, deeply alien to Bible believing Christians, but an important aspect of the poet's Catholic faith have been given a good deal of airtime alongside him. Subtly and engagingly, with few people aware that it is happening, the practices of the Roman Catholic Church, including the Mass, the Rosary, prayers for the dead, praying for the saints and to Mary, to idols and to icons, have come more and more into use and are associated with Christianity in the minds of the readers, viewers and listeners. In such a climate, those who oppose such practices are out of step, unreasonable and intolerant. That's what they call true Bible-believing Christians, because they even teach that the Mass, Rosary prayers, prayers for the dead, praying to the saints and to Mary, to idols and icons, is Christianity, which it is in no way. Protestantism or Bible-believing Christianity does not fare nearly so well in the media. The former moderator of the Free Church of Scotland, Angus Smith, reacted to all that is going on in forthright fashion. Quote, the most bigoted church in the world has smothered Protestantism with propaganda against bigotry. Unquote. Protestant publications are not reviewed in the media, nor are their concerns and warnings given coverage unless there is a form of dramatic public confrontation. There is concern that following the Salman Rushdie affair, revision of the blasphemy law would be used to prevent distribution of books, tapes and tracts warning of the dangers of ecumenism, interchurch and interfaith. Such a law would be a reversal from the, uh, of the freedoms that stem from the Reformation, that flowed from the Bill of Rights and Acts of Toleration and led to the much abused Catholic Emancipation Act. Scottish Reformation Society Secretary General Sinclair Horn, speaking in 1981, claimed that, quote, most leading editors of our newspapers and most leading television producers were Roman Catholics, unquote. Certainly, ten years later, it is still true of a very high proportion of editors, proprietors, religious correspondents and leading columnists of the press. The House of Commons Press launched of Spirit of 88, an enterprise set up in 1988 to commemorate co in uh, coinciding major anniversaries of our Christian heritage, such as the placing of the English Bible in all the churches, deliverance from the Armada and the Glorious Revolution was attended by journalists from leading no, uh, national newspapers and addressed by well-known churchmen. However, not a word was printed. One young reporter from a leading national daily said that he was amazed by his editor's decision to exclude the article that he had prepared. In sharp contrast, as we examine later, Vatican Press disclosures and printed <coughs> are printed in full and often supported editorially. Such disclosures often include material contributing to the careful orchestrated public line that the Vatican is taking on a particular issue. For example, pleading poverty to combat exaggerated tales of her great wealth provides regular material for the press. Concerning church unity, occasional headline stories to rock the ecumenical boat have appeared during the top-level meetings and negotiations, strengthening the Vatican hand inexorably. They claim to come from, quote, unofficial Vatican sources, unquote, as if they have been leaked, although Vatican watchers deny that this happens. For example, on Easter Day 1989, the Mail on Sunday and Banner headlines declared, quote, Crisis as the Pope blames Runcie, primate flying to Vatican to save church unity talks, unquote. Such 
impact-making press coverage undoubtedly bolsters Rome's bargaining position and in the current climate strengthened her hand inexorably. The Pope's role as the peacemaker could hardly enjoy a more favorable coverage in the media. Even when he adopts a political position deeply unpopular in the West, such as his strong criticism of the Allies' decision to go to war against Saddam Hussein, it does not seem to surface and he escapes opprobrium. Well, the Pope's role as peacemaker when he held the <laughs> deeply unpopular position that uh, and strong criticism of the Allies' decision to go to war with Saddam Hussein, that was only the outward, the official policy of the Pope. No coalition of the free, or whatever they're going to call it, or called it at that time, would have been there, and nobody would have dared to go into Iraq and attack Saddam Hussein if it wasn't that therefore that the Pope gave the orders. You have to understand that the open policy of the Vatican is another than the secret policy of the Vatican. And there are numerous examples for that anyway. And that first Gulf War in the beginning of the 1990s of last century is just one example of it. There is a Roman Catholic training school at Hatch End in Middlesex, where are, lo <coughs> where are located quote, the best equipped television studios possibly in the world, the purpose of which is specifically to train and prepare producers, directors, program presenters, priests and nuns for television broadcasting. Unquote. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church operates a guild of media personalities, according to the protest newspaper The Orange Standard from March 1991. The radio and television center at Hatch End has as its director Dr. James MacDonald, who was previously in charge of projects at the Jesuit-run Center for the Study of Communication and Culture. Lumen 2000, the media arm of the Evangelization 2000, the decade of evangelization, is described by the Catholic Herald as a mammoth religious roadshow with a vision of piping papal masses, messages and images to all corners of the five continents. Unquote. Lumen 2000, which began operations in Rome in 1987, had its first major broadcast with the launch of the Marian Year in 1987 via 18 satellites to an audience of 2 billion people. We can read that in the Evangelical Times from February 1991. The public relations campaign, <laughs> so that's propaganda for the ones with ears to hear, the public relations campaign for Evangelization 2000 is being run by Richard Pollan, chief executive of the publicity firm that he founded, Valen Pollan. Pollan's brief from the Vatican is to convert as many unbelievers as possible to Christianity, preferably to the Roman Catholic branch, by 25th of December AD 2000. So whenever I read Christianity, Sharpen your ears if it is really Christianity that is meant, or, of course, Catholicism. Now the next part we go into is called Catholic Action. Paralleling and complementing the public relations offensive is that which the Scottish evangelical magazine Bulwark calls the power of Catholic action. Quote, Someone said recently that Rome laughs when her power is discussed on a merely theological level, for she knows that her real advancement lies in the way that she can pull the strings of political power and manipulate situations to her advantage. Few people realize how carefully organized Catholic action is, and it is only when one who has been involved in this movement tells of its policy and methods that a true realization of its power and scope are revealed. Every segment of our society is infiltrated by these agents, who are highly trained, paid 
and equipped by the church to do this work. Perhaps its greatest work is done in the political field where its objective is to get laws passed which foster the cause of Roman Catholicism in the land. Unquote. The bulwark points to the achievement of Catholic action in ensuring that bills and acts have been passed in Parliament, which have been beneficial to the Roman Catholic Church in spite of her minority status in the land. Quote, what is most notable in the, ex uh, in the examination of these items of legislation is that at times of great political and economic stress, when the minds of the people of this country were concentrated on other things, Rome stepped in and used these situations to her advantage." Unquote. Education. And still, I want to remind you, go and read Inter Mirifica. It is a very, very, very important papal encyclical that you must understand in all its consequences. The sentence that I said that the Roman Catholic Church calls it her inherent right to own and possess all media is only one part of it. In Miranda Process and also in Mirifica they also go into training everyone who is involved in any way, shape or form with media in their jobs and how they all have to be Roman Catholic educated. Please read that. Okay, we go into education. I would probably rather call this indoctrination, but anyway. The Education Act of 1918 was brought in as the First World War ground to its exhausted halt. It created what is often referred to as a kind of religious apartheid by separating schools into denominations alongside the state system. Roman Catholicism aims everywhere as, quote, the one true church, unquote, to control all education, whether within its membership or not. Pope Pius XI, in his encyclical on the education of youth, declared in 1929, quote, As for the scope of the church's educative mission, it extends over all people without any limitations, according to Christ's command, teach ye all nations nor is there a power which can oppose it or prevent it." Unquote. Pope John XXIII said much in the same thing on the 30th of December 1959, as Professor Lorraine Bettner stated in his scholarly book, Roman Catholicism, which I will eventually read here on my channel too. Quote from Lorraine Bettner. The Roman Catholic Church does not hesitate to claim openly, even in the Protestant and democratic states, that education is exclusively a function of the Roman Catholic Church, as indeed it also claims that preaching and the administration of the sacraments are functions of the Roman Church only. This claims implies this claim implies that education should be denied to all those outside the Roman Church or only granted to the children of non-Romanist parents on the condition that they are placed under the instruction of Roman Catholic teachers. And indeed, this is the policy that the Roman Catholic Church puts into effect in areas where she is in control. Another means by which Rome seeks to maintain control over the people. The ideal taught which the Roman Church strives is found in Spain, where, under a concordat with the Vatican, the schools are financed by the government while the Church supervises the curriculum, selects the teachers and directs the administration of the schools. Protestant schools have always been prohibited. Why should anyone believe that the Roman Catholic Church, wherever holds sway, would be satisfied with anything less? Unquote from Lorraine Bettner's Roman Catholicism, published 1962. Her Majesty the Queen and Her Oath, and here it gets quite interesting and we come to a little extra also. 
but first we read what the author wrote on the bottom of page 109. Most British people have now lost sight of the fact that the coronation oath has for long been to defend and protect our Protestant faith and to, quote, main, to maintain to the utmost of the sovereign's power of the Protestant Reformed religion established by law, unquote. This is partly because Her Majesty the Queen has departed from her oath to the extent that she, shows that she now does not defend what is widely accepted as the Christian religion, let alone the Protestant Reformed faith. The Daily Telegraph's religious correspondent Damien Thompson, writing under the headline, quote, Royal Approval for Koran at Abbey, unquote, noted that, in the unlikely setting of Westminster Abbey, the Queen and Prince of Wales listened intently as Muslim, Hindu, Sikh and Buddhist leaders read or chanted from the sacred texts of their faiths, marking the beginning of 1991's Commonwealth Day observance, which went ahead in its customary multi-faith format. According to some observers, the presence of the prince as well as the queen was a clear sign of royal disapproval of the protests and of evangelical Christians, in particular a petition organized by Anglican Tony Hilton. In 1992 another petition, this time signed by 2,000 evangelical clergymen, received a similar response. In the light of the Duke of Edinburgh's backing of the International Sacred Literature Test, the Queen's strong approval of multi-faith services and Prince Charles' very public espousal of strands of the New Age thought, Parliament and the nation need to be reminded of the Coronation Oath. Now the coronation oath, you can look that up on the internet when you go to the Vatican website of the Vatican Encyclopedia. <coughs> and you look up the Royal Declaration. You have to look up the Royal Declaration of 1689. If you look up the Royal Declaration of 1763, you get something that has nothing to do with that. That's about King George and the United States at that time, that were formed at that time. You have to go to the Royal Declaration of 1689. I'm not going to read the whole article to you, and um, I even have it in written form here, because I was sent a whole Catholic encyclopedia set that was printed between 1907 and 1913, and I have it here. So even though I checked it, I didn't check it very well. And um, ah, I had a bad feeling about it, and I couldn't leave it that way. Um, I'm taking out now the book of the Catholic Encyclopedia, the printed version, from 1912. And there have been made some significant changes to the Royal Declaration that you can find online and to the de Royal Declaration in the book that I have here before me. So I decided to make a new recording of that part of the reading and insert that into the old reading. So my voice will be a little bit different because this is another headset that I use. And, um, well, I'm recording that now a day later, but it is absolutely imperative that I tell you the truth. And the truth is, as it was written in the 1912 Roman Catholic Encyclopedia and not the one that you can find online right now. So, under the Royal Declaration in the Catholic Encyclopedia from 1912, page 213, I'm not going to read the whole stuff, but as I did before, the part that comes before the oath, and I will end with the oath, and then the original recording will go on. The Royal Declaration. This is the name most commonly given to the solemn repudiation of Catholicity, which, in accordance with the provisions of the Bill of Rights from 1689 and of the Act of Succession from 1700, every sovereign succeeding to the throne of Great Britain was, until uh, quite recently, required to make in the presence of the assembled lords and commons. 
This pronouncement has also often been called the King's Protestant Declaration or the Declaration Against Transubstantiation and, but quite incorrectly, the Coronation Oath. With regard to this last term, it is important to notice that the later coronation oath, which for two centuries has formed part of the coronation service and which still, will remain, which still remains unchanged, consists only of certain promises to govern justly and to maintain, quote, the Protestant Reformed religion established by law, unquote. No serious exception has ever been taken by Catholics to this particular formula, but the Royal Declaration, on the other hand, was regarded for long years as a substantial grievance, constituting, as it did, an insult to the faith professed by many millions of loyal subjects of the British Crown, meaning Roman Catholics. Of course, that is an insult for Roman Catholics, because it is a, it is a Protestant paper. Huh? And it is really, really important that I'm going to read this to you right now. Anyway, the terms of this declaration, the article continues, which from 1689 to 1910 was imposed upon the sovereign by statute, ran as follows, and the quote will follow in a moment. It was imposed on the sovereign, sovereign yeah, because the people wanted to have a sovereign that adheres to the law the Protestant law, the Bible, and not the law of the Pope. They wanted to make sure of that. So I'm going to read this again to you, and please ex uh, excuse me for here and, there <coughs> here and there when I have it a little bit hard, because the light is not very good in here, and the printing is very small, and uh, I couldn't read this over day, so I'm going to do that at night with the artificial light. So please excuse me when my sound is not always the... the as good when I read all the words and the pronunciation is not that perfect. But it is very important to you to go to the link that I will provide in the description box of the video and you can read the online version of this oath and then compare it with what I am reading here from the 1912 Catholic Encyclopedia and you will see that they change all their publications. This is another proof of how the Roman Catholic Church is lying always and always again. Okay, so now, what is the oath that the sovereign was so-called imposed upon, as the Catholic Encyclopedia writes it, of course, on the sovereign by statute? Quote, I, A.B., put your name here, Queen or King, by the grace of God, King or Queen of England, Scotland and Ireland, defender of the faith, do solemnly and sincerely in the presence of God profess, testify and declare that I do believe that in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper there is not any transubstantiation of the elements of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ at or after the consecration thereof by any person whatsoever. And that the, inv that the invocation or adoration of the Virgin Mary, or any other saint, and the sacrifice of the Mass, as they are now used in the Church of Rome, are superstitious and idolatrous. And I do solemnly, in the presence of God, profess, testify and declare that I do make this declaration, and every part thereof, in the plain and ordinary words, uh, sense of the words read unto me, as they are commonly understood by English Protestants, without any evasion, equivocation, or mental reservation whatsoever, and without any dispensation already granted me by the Pope, or any other authority or person whatsoever, or without any hope of any such dispensation from any person or authority whatsoever, or without thinking that I am or can be acquitted before God or man, or absolved of this declaration, or any part thereof, although the Pope or any other person or persons or power whatsoever should dispense with 
or annul the same or declare that it was null and void from the beginning. Unquote. Now, why did I read this again? I tell you in a second. When you open up the online version of this oath, you will read, quote, and I do solemnly in the presence of God profess, testify and declare that I do make this declaration and every part thereof in the plain and ordinary sense of the words read unto me as they are commonly understood by English Protestants without any such dispensation from any person or authority or person whatsoever or without thinking that I am or can be acquitted before God or man or absolved of this declaration or any part thereof, although the Pope or any other person or persons or power whatsoever should dispense with or annul the same or declare that it was null and void from the beginning." Unquote, from the online version. Now, what's the difference? Well, the difference is that I just read in the book from 1912 that here it says, and I have to look that up again now, so give me a second here. Here it comes. Understood by English Protestants without any evasion, equivocation or mental reservation whatsoever. This mental reservation is missing from the new Catholic Encyclopedia, and that is very important. Mental reservation is a Jesuit policy, right? Because the end justifies their means. They can do anything because they take mental reservation when they have to take an oath like this. Because they can say, oh yeah, but I was under mental reservation. That oath didn't count for anything. And this very important part is scrapped from the online version, from the Catholic Encyclopedia that you find today online. And therefore, it is absolutely imperative that I read to you the 1912 printed version of the Catholic Encyclopedia of the Royal Declaration. And now I will put this little recording that I did into the original and put it in there and uh, will continue reading the book. This is the Royal Declaration. Every king or queen of England between 1689 and 1910 was supposed to take. Now, I'm going to finish with a little <laughs> change they did to this proclamation in the newer times, after 1910. I, insert name, do solemnly and sincerely in the presence of God profess, testify and declare that I am a faithful protestant and that I will, according to the true intent of the enactments to secure the protestant succession to the throne of my realm, uphold and maintain such enactments to the best of my power." Unquote. That's quite different from what we just read before, right? But therefore, and that you can read it for yourself, I will provide the link in the description box of this video that you can look it up for yourself and you can read the Royal Declaration for yourself. But I thought when the author here ends this last sentence and says, in the light of the Duke of Edinburgh's backing of the International Sacred Literature Trust, the Queen's strong approval of multi-faith services, and Prince Charles' very public espousal of strands of New Age thought, Parliament and the nation need to be reminded of this coronation oath, this royal declaration, because that is what they swear. And how do they treat that oath that they made before God when they are having multi-faith services and have a strong espousal to the strands of New Age? Yeah, exactly. It is like like kicking God in the face, eh?
Okay, the next part of the book on page 110 is called Northern Ireland and the IRA. Many people in Northern Ireland have not lost sight of the sovereign's oath and the constitutional responsibility to uphold the Protestant Reformed faith established by law. Whilst excesses of Protestant reaction cannot be condoned, these Ulster people are unable to understand why the Vatican does not act firmly against the IRA terrorists. <laughs> I will learn about that. Many of them argue that a word from the pontiff to the priesthood, the threat of excommunication or the murderers of innocents and the discontinuing of funerals for dead terrorists would swiftly bring peace to Ireland. The absence of any such sanctions is significant, to say the least. Sunday Telegraph editor Peregrine Worsthorn expressed the same thought in his February 1991 leader The Ugly Face of Islam. Quote, For years there has been no credible Islamic condemnation of terrorism. One could say the same thing about the Roman Catholic Church's attitude to terrorism in Ireland. Unquote. The International Herald Tribune revealed that at Strasbourg in 1988 Ian Paisley accused the Pope of having sent crucifixes to the IRA hunger strikers, according to the International Herald Tribune 12th of October 1988. This was reported in only one of the British newspapers at that time and has not been denied to date. At the time of the hunger strikes in April 1981, the Vatican intervened in the political process much to the embarrassment of the British government. The intervention involved Cardinal Casseroli, Secretary of State at the Vatican, Cardinal Magee, the Pope's private secretary, Cardinals Hume and Ophake, primates from of England and Ireland, the papal nuncios of the UK and Ireland, as well as representatives of the British government. Meanwhile, those sympathetic to the plight of Ulster continued to wonder why the media so regularly features Roman Catholic prelates of, as spokesmen for the public outrage and for the condemnation of IRA violence, especially as there are so many instances of priests who seem to be supportive of the terrorists. For example, the Sunday Express on 17th of May 1987 printed the eulogy given by Father Brian McNeese at Requiem Mass for IRA mass murderer Patrick Kelly. Quote, he was an upright and truthful man who loved his family, his Irish culture, his faith and his country. Unquote. Yeah. Could have said the same thing about Hitler, eh? People also wonder how and why a priest apparently deeply involved in the IRA terrorism could have been allowed to go entirely free. The conduct of the governments of Belgium and Ireland, two of Europe's most Roman Catholic countries, in relation to the Patrick Ryan extradition following his hunger strike, again gives a glimpse of the shadow of Rome. Many people are puzzled and distressed that the sensational disclosure that the former priest used the Vatican Bank to smuggle IRA funds was so low-key in the British press. The Sunday Times of 4th of December 1988 gave little space to report that British intelligence had uncovered an IRA network which included Ryan and which had infiltrated and used Catholic Church banks worldwide. Tens of millions of pounds are said to have been moved through terrorist accounts to finance IRA-controlled businesses. Patrick Ryan has sued the British government for one million pounds in libel damages because judgments given in Ireland can be enforced in Britain under European legislation. The newspapers, according to the Sunday Times, have made statements, no doubt drawing on information supplied by the government which they, now, which they are now unable to defend. They may have to pay out millions, which no doubt would go straight into the pockets of the IRA. The reader may conclude that to be employed in special branch or other intelligence services must be very demoralizing at times. 
those with memories long enough can recall a remarkably similar apparent suppression of news following a major disclosure in the Irish press on the 26th of May 1933. The story told for the first time after 17 years how, three weeks before the Easter week uprising of 1916, Pope Benedict XV received a mission from the Irish volunteer executive headed by George Noble, Count Plunkett. Details of the insurrection were discussed with the Pope and the rebellion was blessed with his apostolic benediction on the men who were facing death for Ireland's liberty. The Irish press disclosure revealed that the blessing of the Irish rebellion coincided with the receiving of the British envoy to the Vatican. Observers at that time felt that the whole press of the land should have been expected to clamor with indignation against such hypocrisy. But not a word! Strangely, as with Ryan in 1988, only the Times and perhaps two other papers reproduced the item a day late and without comment of any kind. The news was simply smothered. Another example of apparent news suppression, of which we have clear record, relates to when RHS Grossman, then an Oxford Don and later minister on, in uh, Harold Wilson's government, broadcast from Berlin as a BBC correspondent in 1934. Describing unsettled conditions in Germany and Austria following Hitler's great blood purge, he stated that wherever he went, he was met with the indignant declaration that the Pope was behind all the trouble. Immediately he mentioned the Pope, there was dead silence on the wireless. Mr. Crossman's talk was omitted from the listener. Several people wrote to the BBC requesting copies of the complete talk, but were refused any further information. You can read that in Albert Close, Jesuit Plots from Elizabethan to Modern Times. If such news is being restricted under D-notice regulations, then the very big question that emerges is who is doing the regulating and for whom. The loss of public confidence in both, polit pol polis in, in both police and judiciary following the release of the Guildford Four and the Birmingham Six is a major victory for the IRA and is seen as serving the wider objective of weakening resistance to the yielding of our country's institutions to European federalism what eventually became the EU, the European Union, the revived Holy Roman Empire of Europe we are living in today. today. Sorry. That was chapter 9 of the book All Roads Lead to Rome, Protestantism Under Siege. And I urge you really to read Miranda Prosos and to read Intermirifica. To really get these papers, you can find them online on the Vatican website itself, to go in there to study it and to have an understanding of who and by what means the media totally, totally is controlled. This little outlet, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth, will be shut down eventually because it says the truth as it is. And I cannot be controlled by any man because I give my allegiance to Jesus Christ. And when you read these papers, you will understand that there is nothing in the media that ever tells the truth. So when you go to a so-called alternative media, even like me, test them. Test their spirit. Test what they say against the Bible. Test what they say in history. Is it really true? Test what they say every word against the Bible. You can hold my word against the Bible. I hope you do. I'm not perfect. I can here and there make a mistake. I can still learn. And I want to learn, 
I want to learn from my Lord, and that's why I want to teach you in the name of the Lord all these things, and read this book, and explain this book. But it takes your own effort to study it for yourself. Read people, read pieces and papers like Intermirifica and Miranda Prozis to understand for yourself that it is not just Jogla 66 that is ranting around here, but that is really the truth that is hidden from, the, from you, that is not taught anywhere. And when you get to the real truth, when you really understand how the Roman Catholic Church, the Antichrist, runs the whole system, then you will finally understand that the Jews are even betrayed as the Gentiles, or as blacks, or as Asians, as everyone, by Rome, by the whore of Babylon. We are all betrayed. And the only way out is the Bible. The only true Bible, the King James of 1611 and Jesus Christ, who can be found in that Bible and in no other Bible. And then we go to him and we pray. And we say, Lord, forgive us our sins. Because we know we are wretched. We are wicked. And we need you and we need your blood to stand in front of the Father. There is no one saved, always saved. Always pray again. Pray for strength. Pray for help. Pray for the love of God. Of the real God, the one God. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So thanks for listening, thanks for watching, and until next time with chapter 10, the Vatican below the surface. Until then, Jogler 66 from Hour of the Truth says, God bless you, signing off, bye bye. We as Bible believing Christians, we know that the hand that is behind ISIS, the hand that is behind Al Qaeda, is the same hand that is behind the United States of America government, that is behind the European Union government, and that is behind all the armies in the world, and that is behind all these um, mercenary companies out in the world, like XE, or formerly called Blackwater, run by Knights of Malta, etc., etc. So this is something that you really have to understand. This is all just a theater. And the point is, where is this theater going to lead to? When you are a Bible-believing Christian, you know that in the end times, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, there will be wars, wars, and rumors of wars. And we know that the Antichrist, by peace, will destroy many. And so on, and so on, and so on. I could start citing the whole Bible up and down right now with citations like this to tell you what it's all about. But I don't have to sing to the choir or preach to the choir. You as Bible-believing Christians already know that. So the only thing that I ask of you is don't be caught in their game. Because when you are and you play their game, you have to play by their rules. And their rules are not Christ's rules. So the only thing that I can advise you of is, okay, take that information in what happens about there, pray for the people that these victims are being taken good care of, and that they are just deceived people, that they maybe have a chance by going through this situation, maybe they have a way to find to Christ in this way. Maybe they have a way to find to the real truth. I mean, these people are Muslims and coming from Muslim countries and coming to so-called, quote-unquote, Christian countries. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian. Of course, the Protestant churches today don't preach any protest anymore. All right, I know that. But still, here and there, it is possible that a grain falls on the ground that can fall on fruitful ground, even with these refugees and the whole situation that is coming up. 
And that is the hope that we should have as Bible-believing Christians. And that is the prayer that we should use every day when we address our Lord to pray for our enemies as we pray for our friends. Because Jesus said, love your enemies and love your neighbors.